Welcome to Oklahoma Gardening. On today's episode, host Casey Hinches walks through the waking garden and talks about some of the exciting plans that we have in store for the coming season. We build an insect hotel out of found items in the garden. Turfgrass specialist Justin Moss has tips and tools to get our mower ready for spring. We take part in a prescribed fire at the Botanic Garden at OSU, and Barbara Brown prepares Baja fish tacos. Gardening is a production of the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the land-grant mission of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University, dedicated to improving the quality of life of the citizens of Oklahoma through research-based information. Underwriting assistance is provided by TLC, Oklahoma's leading garden center, Southwood Landscape and Nursery, Tulsa's source for great gardens, and the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry, helping to keep Oklahoma green and growing. Someone once said that a garden is never as good as it will be next year, and I have to agree with this statement. Spring is the time when we start with a clean slate. We have a fresh garden coming up, and we have new plans and new plants to try. We're excited, and you know, a lot of people make their New Year's resolutions around January 1st, but I think for gardeners, our New Year's resolutions come in the springtime. This is gonna be the year that that flower finally blooms. This is going to be the year that you beat the squash bug, and this is going to be the year that watering is no longer a challenge. You know, the energy that we're starting to feel, um, we're just tired of looking at plant catalogs, and we're tired of being teased by the plants that are coming into the nurseries, and we're ready to get out and start planting. Here at the Botanical Gardens in Stillwater at OSU, we're feeling the same way. We've been planning all winter long, and we've got a lot of projects that we're ready to get started. But behind me is one of those. This is the herb garden, which we expanded last season with the new hardscaped walls. And you can see we've got a lot of plants that we've already planted, and these were transplanted from the old herb garden. But we're going to be filling in a lot of this over the next few months. A lot of times as our garden ages, our intentions for those gardens and needs for those gardens also change. We're here in what used to be our old orchard, and as these trees have aged a little bit, the, the orchard has declined. We will be planting new trees, new fruit trees, outside of the vegetable garden, and what we're gonna do is reinvent this space into what will be known as the concept garden. This will be where we build a lot of our experimental projects for the show, and it will be an opportunity for you as visitors to come to the Botanic Garden here at OSU and see some of those projects and how they're progressing. Over the season, we would also love to hear what experimental garden projects you have going on in your own backyard. You never know when we might show up. While it might not be time to get out and start planting everything just yet, there is some stuff that you can do to start prepping your garden for planting. Here in the quad garden, we are starting to put down some drip irrigation, and we're also adding some fresh composted soil to get it ready for planting. We are transitioning this garden from what used to be an earth, wind, fire, and water theme into a more agriculture theme. We're going to recognize plants that originally started in the agriculture world but have been cultivated more and more and are being used in an ornamental landscaped way, such as sweet potato vine, red okra, and ornamental peppers. Each season, Oklahoma Gardening has taken a regional tour and this year we're actually going to visit that region not just once, but we're gonna be looking at it during each season to give you a better understanding of the diversity of Oklahoma. I'm excited to let you know that this year we're going to be going to southeastern Oklahoma where we're gonna be visiting the Lane Research Center and some of the work that they're doing with cool season crops that are grown organically. We're also gonna be visiting some aquaponic systems and looking at some champion trees. Now we're gonna to continue to bring you relevant and timely information for you to use in your backyard, but if you're like me, your interests and your concerns go beyond your backyard. 
Therefore, we're going to bring you research that Oklahoma State University is conducting, research that's being done in the cities, and also by other state departments. Whatever your resolution is as a gardener, I hope you continue to enjoy the process of gardening with us. So often we look at our garden and think that it's not tidy enough and we need to clean it up a little bit more. But you know, nature isn't always clean and tidy either. And there's a benefit to that. We get a lot of insects in our garden. Now, if you wanna keep your garden neat and tidy, you might think about using some of those untidy items in a different way. We've got another way to recycle some of those old garden scraps. And what we're gonna to build today is a insect hotel. Um, here we've created the structure for ours already, and this is a quite large one. Um, we've made it out of several layers of pallets and, and cinder blocks and different bricks and things, and you don't need to necessarily make one this big. But what we've created is a lot of holes and nooks where we're going to fill it with that plant debris and entice different insects to come in here. Now we've placed ours in kind of a partly shady area and that's because some insects like shade. Um, frogs and toads like to be in a shade damp area where some of your insects like bees like to be up in the sunny location. So you can see we've got a lot of sun up here on the top of it. If you don't want to build one this large because you know it can be quite a construction feat, um, we have stabilized ours with some T-posts in the center here. But you can also recycle old birdhouses. So here we have an old birdhouse that you can see also has different nooks and crannies in it so that you can fill those with organic matter. And basically any container that has different spaces that you can fill would make a great ideal uh, insect hotel. It doesn't have to be a particular size at all. You can see this is much smaller, whereas the one we built here is much larger. The one thing you want to keep in mind is that you're trying to invite insects into your backyard and so you don't want this right by your back door. Here we've placed it a little bit further away from the main garden um, and the next thing to do is we just need to fill all these crevices with our organic matter to make it more inviting for those insects. We've filled our holes with a variety of textures and materials and again you're trying to create a habitat for a lot of different insects and different insects need different things. There are some insects that like to be solitary, in fact there are some bees that like to be solitary and so we've drilled some holes here in these old stumps because they'll come in behind here and lay their eggs in here and then actually cover them over with mud. So this is a great uh, thing for solitary bees. We've purposely place these on the sunny side of the insect hotel uh, because bees are one insect that like to be in the sunshine. Now down below here we've got some other materials that we've used. Um, we have in fact here an old clay pot that we've placed in here for frogs and toads. Uh, they like to be in a more moist area and so we've put them down on the, the soil level um, and they can go in there and get away from any of the other critters. There's other things such as corrugated cardboard that we've used, which is a nice thing for lace wings um, to create a habitat for those. And those are another beneficial insect. We had a lot of fun building this here at the gardens and I would encourage you also to build one. It's fun to be creative. Um, you can use different materials. And again, it can be almost any size. You can use two liter bottles, tin cans, yarn, a lot of different things. You can see here we've cleaned out our garden and we've used a lot of different organic matters, but I would encourage you to go see what you can find in your backyard and invite those insects in. We would love to hear about your insect hotel, so please share with us any stories or photos that you have.
We are here at the OSU Botanic Gardens with John Weir, a research associate um, with the Inrin department. And John, can you tell us what we've just done here? Well, we come in and we uh, did a burn on the native grass plantings and the native grass areas here at the Botanical Garden. Okay, so this was a planned prescribed burn, correct? It was a planned burn, that's correct. <laughs> and so what did you have to do in order to plan this burn? Well, first thing you want to do is again make sure the area that you're burning, you've got some kind of fire breaks or area that you're going to keep the fire contained in. So here at the Botanical Garden, we had the, the walking trails, mm -hmm. we had the creek, and the areas were mowed really short around our native grass side. So that, that served as our fire breaks for the areas that we were going to burn. Okay. And then from doing that, then we went in and we, we notified the local authorities of what we were doing. We had to get a hold of OSU Fire Marshal, OSU Police, and the Stillwater Fire Department, let them know that we're burning. Again, being within the city limits, we, we had to do that, but we were on OSU property, so we follow what the OSU guidelines are for OSU property. And so we're allowed, we were allowed to burn on that. Okay, so there's a lot involved before you just go out Yeah, you and don't do just this. walk out and strike them <laughs> and go walk out and say, boy, today looks like a good day to burn, and I just go throw a match out and walk back in and right. grab a glass of tea and watch TV. Right, so, so after not... you've talked to the authorities and all the appropriate people, there is some to looking at the environmental conditions, right. though. Right, then, then we're, then we're going to look at weather conditions of, of what it's going to do. Again, we don't want the wind just blowing a hurricane. We do want some wind because we want to know which where's the fire going to and also where's the smoke heading. So okay. again, you know, with here at the Botanical Garden, we are on the north side of Highway 51, so we burned with a south wind, so we didn't put any kind of smoke. Even though our burns were small and didn't produce a lot of smoke, mm -hmm. we didn't want to put smoke across the highway, so we burned with a, actually with a southeast wind so we could take it away from campus, away from any kind of housing, so it went back to the northwest where there's very little houses or any kind of problems, and okay. we kept it off the highway. That so, makes sense. Yeah, a yeah. lot of times you think about burning on a calm day, but in this right. case, you use the wind to your favor. We'll use the wind to your favor to manage your smoke. And again, so you, you want winds somewhere around four to 15 mile an hour, because what, if the wind gets below four mile an hour, it's kind of, it becomes light and variable. Okay. And so that variable gets you because it, it'll blow one minute, you know, one direction, then the next minute it's blowing another direction. And okay. so you got your fire going every different direction and you got smoke going all kinds of different directions too. And so that causes lots of problems. So you want a known wind direction and within a good conditions. And then relative humidity is one of the next things. Again, we, we picked a good high humidity day because that way issues not, we're not out here wanting just a really hot fire. We're just trying to burn and remove the old gra growth vegetation right. off the old growth and mulch off of it right. and get a good burn. We're not trying to create just the hottest fire we can get. We're not trying to kill cedar or knock brush back. Right, you can like see that. there's the pine tree still yeah, doing it, fine yeah, behind us. Water. Yeah, it's still fine. And uh, so it was, a, it was a very humid day that we that we picked here. And uh, so again, those kind of conditions and that, that makes it a whole lot safer too as well. We're, there wasn't an issue about it going anywhere, any kind of spot right. fires, any kind of problem. And, and you can see not all of it burned behind us, and there's a couple of reasons. There is some cool season grass right. coming up, but that's okay, that's right? Not, I mean, that's, that's a, not the purpose is to completely again, burn it all. And that's what, you know, that's what a native, you know, a, a, a natural native setting of a grassland, shrubland, of native setting, that's what it is. It is a very mosaic, patchy landscape. It's not all one species of grass. It's, it's a very diverse landscape, and that's what you get with these kind of fires, with a patchy mosaic type of fire. You'll, and you'll get areas that good green, fresh growth. There'll be probably some different vegetation, you know, different plants come up that you won't see in the areas that didn't burn. But the next time you go to burn this, those areas will burn better that didn't burn because they, they're, they're accumulating more fuel than these areas that you that you have burned before. And you say fuel. Now we're not talking like typical gasoline right. over there. And that's what, it I, is... that's what I call vegetation right. is fuel. They, for me, it's fuel. So we're talking about the dry material is that's the right. fuel for the fire right. that that's will correct. cause it to grow. That's okay. Right. Um, and so over here, we've burned a pasture. Now on the other side of the property, we burned the prairie that was installed about three years about ago. About three years ago. Why yeah. are we burning our prairie? Because again, it's it's we we planted it about three years ago. It's when it was planted. Mm -hmm. Doing again, it's got it, it had some stuff coming in on it that we was wanting to kind of knock back some mm -hmm. of the cool season stuff. Because again, it's a warm season native grass planting with again some other forbs and, and other things that are in it. And so a, an early spring burn is very favorable for those. And so again, so we can knock back. But also again, the benefits of the fire that you're going to get to those native plants. Native plants. You know, our native grasses, native forbs are all adapted to fire. Mm -hmm. They need fire to be a 
you know, a complete part of their growth cycle. They're adapted to getting burned off and then regrowing back in. You know, they come back real quick following fire. And so they're all adapted to that. And if, if somebody can't burn, mowing is an option? Mowing but... is an option, you know, weed eating, you know, whatever you've got to. If you can't burn or do that, you're, you're not going to get the benefit of of fire, it's not it's not like fire right. by by no means. You do get some things again. You get some of that removal of old growth, getting all that knocked back, so you can see your fresh green growth a lot better, and and help with a little bit of the vigor of the plants. But again, you don't get the nutrient cycling that you get with fire. Uh, again, the benefits to microorganisms that are in the soil and all that, you don't get all those benefits. Okay, excellent. Yeah. And and is there any advice you have for anybody else? Is there education classes that they can again, take about we have, this? We have a, through the in rim extension uh -huh. uh, we have a lot of uh, fact sheets on fire conducting burns fire videos uh, so we've, we've got a lot of information out there there's also groups uh, we, we have what are called prescribed burn associations scattered around the states where groups of landowners get together work together to help each other burn okay. property and again a lot of these a lot of them we think of them as large tracts of land but they burn a lot of times they're, they burn 10 20 acres you know smaller smaller tracts again it's whatever you want to do and so if you had an area that, that you're wanting to burn be involved with one of those burn associations and there's good information about that because it is definitely a team effort it's, it's nice having plenty of hands out plenty here of help plenty of equipment it's always good it makes it safer makes it easier to do and less worry right okay well thank you so much for telling us about this right, prescribed burn Springtime, it's warming up, a good time to think about getting your mower ready to mow the lawn for the spring and the summer. So here we just have a typical push mower that most homeowners would have, something like this. And what we want to do is just go through and check everything out, make sure it's ready to mow. So here uh, we can uh, make sure we got fuel in the tank. We can go in and we can uh, check out the oil, look at the oil level, and also look at the oil color. And if it hasn't been changed in a while, uh, maybe change the oil. In, the, in your unit. We can take a look at the air filter, uh, take it apart and examine it and if needed just take a, an, a, a blower to it and just blow out any uh, particles or grass particles that may be in it and put it back in. If you see that it's pretty dirty you go ahead and buy a new one and install that. And then it's always a good idea to check the spark plug and take it out, examine it and if needed clean it off reinstall it or if you think you need to go ahead and get a new spark plug and, and install it at this time and then it's a, uh, also a good time to to uh, uh, take the spark plug unit off and check your mower blade and so what you can do is just lift up the mower get underneath inspect your blade uh, take it off of the unit and then if needed sharpen it up make sure it's level and then reinstall and another thing that you can do if you don't have maybe a shop in your home is you can just use some simple tools from any home improvement store and what you see right here is we have uh, this is actually a new blade here but just to demonstrate this is on um, a little balance here and, and when we sharpen our blade not only do we want to make sure it's sharp but we want to make sure it's balanced on both sides so that it's not an um, uneven mowing and so you can buy just a little sharpening stone like this. So if you have a, a power drill, you can just put this on your power drill and use it as a sharpener. One thing you probably want to be aware of, if these are very good for straight edges, but sometimes uh, for our mowers, we'll have mulching blades and they have these curved edges, which can be a little bit tricky to sharpen. In that case, depending on your mower blade, you may want to buy a new blade or take it to a professional to sharpen, or you can try it yourself at home. Another handy tool is this little clamp right here, and this actually goes um, under the mower on the blade, and what it will do is it will stop your blade from spinning. So when you lift your mower up, you have this attached underneath, this little clamp, and then the blade will not turn when you're trying to remove the blade, and that just protects you uh, to make sure you don't jam your hand under there. Another interesting thing you can do is as you're changing this out for the springtime, if you have uh, thatch worries in your yard, you can use uh, this little thing right here. It's just a, a mower blade, but it's got these 
um, plastic units that come down and what they do, these little fingers can dig into the uh, grass and can help to break up a thatch layer and give it like a power raking or vertical mowing almost type effect. And so nowadays you can just use a regular mower with an attachment like this and get a nice power raking in your yard. Do that one time in the spring and take it back off and then install your regular mulching blade. Today we're doing fish tacos. Now most of the time when we talk about fish tacos we don't use fish sticks but that is in fact what I'm going to do today uh, to show you a little bit of a shortcut. So keep in mind that if you have the objection to the fish stick you could also go out and grill your your own fish uh, and approach it that way. But this is a shortcut. It's also a way that kids tend to like it. So if you've got kids in the family they may be more accepting uh, if you do it this way. So I've got a cup of finely shredded cabbage uh, and I did do uh, very finely shredded. In fact I did it so well that this is how you buy it at the market in a bag. So uh, that's a shortcut that you could do if either you don't have any in your own garden or it's just not the right season. I also have uh, some thin slices of red onion. Now this looks like to me when I first put it in here that it's a lot of red onion. It also looks like a lot of cabbage, but we're going to um, have it collapse a little bit. I'm going to add about a pinch of salt is all it takes here. I've added kosher salt to it and about a half a teaspoon of fresh lime juice. And here I really again would encourage the fresh lime juice because it just gives it a much better flavor. Then we're going to let this sit for a little while, uh, maybe about 30 minutes. Uh, you do this first and uh, you'll find that it collapses down on itself uh, because of the acid and the salt that you've put in there. So I'm just going to let that sit. Ours probably won't collapse as much as I'd like, but we'll uh, let it have a little bit of time. Uh, the next phase that I'm going to do is to put together a sauce. And so what I have here is a third of a cup, double check, yep, a third of a cup of uh, yogurt. And to that I'm going to add an eighth of a teaspoon of cumin and a well, third of a teaspoon of chili powder and an eighth of a teaspoon of cumin. Here you can kind of play with it. Uh, again, another pinch of salt. We're going to stir those together. And this is going to add a lot of the flavor because if you're using fish sticks, you're not going to have uh, put a lot of chili powder on the fish sticks. So you're going to be depending on those chili flavors to come in from other sources. And that may be a little bit of the reason why kids like it when it's made this way because it's not quite as spicy. Uh, again, you could add more chili powder if you wanted to, uh, to uh, perk it up more. I've also added two tablespoons of chopped cilantro and just stir those together, set it aside and let it wait for you. Now while you're doing that, you're going to go ahead and bake the fish sticks however the package tells you to do it. So uh, we're going to go on to the next step because ours are already done. Usually those are going to take you around uh, 20 to, to 30 minutes depending on the brand. These are actually uh, tilapia fish sticks um, because I didn't want to get the minced kind. Uh, so you can look through the, the freezer section in the market and see what they have. But remember, you could also start with catfish fillets or uh, tilapia fillets from the market and either gr grill them, pan uh, fry them, or um, pan bake them. So you have a lot of choices there. Uh, the next step is we need to heat the tortillas. So I have uh, tortillas that are already in the microwave. And what I did for these was to uh, wrap them in some damp paper towels. We'll put them in there for about oh, 30 to 45 seconds uh, until they get so that they, when you fold them, they're not apt to crack. You could also, however, uh, if you had a couple of ovens, so because your other oven is in theory busy with the fish sticks, uh, set the oven about 350, wrap them in aluminum foil, and put them in the, in the oven until they get warm. Again, you, you want them warm through, but you don't want to put them in a pan to heat them because most likely you're going to get them too far uh, heated and, and cooked, and they're actually going to crack when you uh, fold them in half. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and get these done, and then we'll come over and finish up. Once the tortillas are hot, you're ready to start assembling. Now you notice these are nice and soft as opposed to crunchy things, uh, but they're also nice and warm. Now the trick to this one uh, that we found uh, practicing here uh, is that using two of the tortillas is a better choice. Otherwise things tend to get soggy and break through and then you have uh, a bit of a mess and uh, you no longer have a, a taco. So uh, I'm going to 
do this a little bit differently than we've tried it in the past because my experience is that this acts a little bit like glue and holds everything in the middle. So we're going to spread about a fourth of the sauce that we made and then we need about a fourth of a cup of our salad mixture with the uh, cabbage and the onion. And we're going to spread that on top of that and then we're going to put two of the fish sticks on the top of that and then this basically becomes your tortilla and your taco is ready to go. So uh, people, once these are on the table, anybody can do their own. They're very tasty. If you find you don't need the second tortilla and you just don't like it, it sometimes people think it's a little bit dry with both of them. Uh, you can try it without. Worst case scenario, if your uh, tortilla breaks in the middle, you eat your taco with a fork off the plate. But I think that you're going to love these. I think the kids in your family are going to love them as well. I hope you'll try them. They're Baja Fish Tacos for Oklahoma Gardening. I'm Barbara Brown. There are lots of great horticultural events this time of year. Be sure and consider these activities when you're making your plans for the weeks ahead. Next week, we'll plant and protect tomatoes in the vegetable garden. Justin Moss will have spring mowing tips, and we will visit the greenhouses that provide the plants that keep the Oklahoma State University campus so beautiful. So join us then for more TV You'll Grow to Love. To find out more information about show topics, as well as recipes, videos, articles, fact sheets, and other resources, including a directory of local extension offices, be sure and visit our website, oklamagardening.okstate.edu. And we always have great information, answers to questions, photos, and gardening discussions on your favorite social media as well. Join in on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can find this entire show and other recent shows, as well as individual segments on our Oklahoma Gardening YouTube channel. And tune in to our OK Gardening Classics YouTube channel to watch segments from previous hosts. Oklahoma Gardening is produced by the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University. The Botanic Garden at OSU is home to our studio gardens and we encourage you to come visit this beautiful Stillwater Jewel. We wish to thank our generous underwriters, TLC Garden Centers, Southwood Landscape and Garden Center, and the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry. Additional support is provided by Pond Pro Shops, Greenleaf Nursery and the Garden Debut Plants, and the Oklahoma Horticultural Society.